So uh, what I want to talk about tonight is God is always only good. You know, when we are younger, um, it is said that we are not responsible for the way we look. But as we get older, we do become responsible because our faces start looking like what we are on the inside. And this was Megan and Adam's wedding. The little girl on the left is Ben's daughter, Chloe, my granddaughter, and then um, Adam's little niece, Avery, over on the other side. So um, my grandmother, Garlock, on my dad's side, was one of the sweetest women you would ever want to meet. And the last seven years of hers and grandpa's life, they came down to Greenville, South Carolina, where I live, and um, live with my parents. Um, and my grandma, during those seven years, had numerous mini heart attacks. So she would be in and out of the hospital. And when I would go visit her at the hospital, the nurses and the doctors would all say, you have the sweetest grandmother. She would always talk about how good the Lord was. She didn't complain. She always kept a, a drawer of gifts. And they said, nobody comes in and out of this room without getting a little gift. I mean, it would be not much, but she wanted to give everybody something. So you, you might think, well, she must have had a very wonderful life to be you know, so sweet. And she did. She had a lot of wonderful blessings, but she had a lot of challenges as well. Did I go too far? This is, um, that's my parents, my mom and dad, um, the Garlocks, and this is a house my dad grew up in. It was two bedrooms, and it had what they called a third bedroom. Dad said it was just an oversized closet that they had two beds in, <laughs> a bunk bed and then a bed that he and his brother had to sleep in. He said the mattress kind of caved in the middle, so no matter where you were, you, we were <laughs> always right there in the middle. But um, <clears throat> there were nine children. She had nine children, and um, they, were, they were very poor. Dad said every morning for breakfast they had oatmeal and powdered milk, for lunch, there was a Verona uh, Women's League that would bus the children downtown to their headquarters and give them a hot meal and a vitamin tablet. And then for supper, Dad said they'd have oatmeal again with no powdered milk. But um, they, he had a very, very happy childhood, but, but they were poor. Um, this picture is uh, eight of the nine children. Okay, I'm going to start... On the left, <clears throat> that is uh, the, the left front, is my Uncle Don. And he taught speech at Liberty University and was the chaplain of their football team. He does, he's retired now. Um, Uncle Ed is in the back. Uncle Ed um, was in the Marine Band. And they were responsible for picking up all the dead bodies off of Iwo Jima. And um, he came back from World War II and was never the same. Um, but he became a chauffeur in New York City. Anyway, that's Uncle Ed. And then Aunt Eunice in the front, um, to my grandmother's right, was um, the oldest girl. And when she was 18, she had um, what they called a nervous breakdown at the time. But later, she was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. And she was in and out of mental hospitals, but she, they finally found a medicine that helped her and she was able to get married and have three really beautiful children. Um, she just passed away a couple years ago. Aunt Eunice, a prayer warrior. <laughs> and then Aunt Alice was the youngest daughter. There are only two daughters out of the nine children. Aunt Alice was an opera singer and she just passed away several years ago with a brain tumor. Then my dad is right behind Aunt Alice and um, dad, is a musician <laughs> and preacher. Um, I love my dad. And then Uncle Bob is behind him. Uncle Bob was the chaplain of the Reno um, Police Department. And he was, help he was giving a lady a ticket once on the road. And as he gave the ticket and was walking back to his car, she backed up over him. And it, it destroyed his back pretty much. He had numerous surgeries after that. Um, and then Uncle Elmer right behind my grandmother, um, became an alcoholic, and he died uh, of cirrhosis of the liver when he was 35 years old. And then Uncle Vic, in the back, the middle back, um, when he was 18, he was in a printing press accident. And um, he was cleaning it at night with a friend, and the friend accidentally turned 
the machines on and he was stranded between two rollers, um, his left arm and his right foot. And the doctors, when they came, they had to cut off his arm to get him out without morphine. They said it would have killed him. And they were able to save his right foot. But he turned little, literally gray overnight from the shock of that trauma. But anyway, this picture, um, there's only eight that you see of the nine children. The ninth child is my Uncle David. He was a concert pianist. Um, but when he was 25, he was on a concert tour in California. Um, he took his own life with an overdose of pills. So when you see this picture back here, um, the reason there are only eight children there, that's, they're at his funeral, so right there. So you can see my grandmother didn't have, <laughs> she had a good life. I don't want to minimize that. She had a very good life and a lot of blessings. But she had a lot of challenges, but she remained very, very sweet. Um, my grandmother chose to dwell on God's goodness, not her circumstances. She became better, not bitter. She became the victor and not the victim. You know, we go down many roads in this life. Some are bumpy and rough and curvy, and some are smooth and straight. Some are so smooth and straight, we can almost go on auto cruise, right? Don't you have times of your life that it's, the road just seems easier than others? And then sometimes it's so rough and bumpy that you have to keep your eyes glued to the road. God made our world to be beautiful and good. He made the world and everything in it to be beautiful and good. Satan through Adam and Eve, brought sin into this world and consequently bad things. It will serve us well to remember that Satan is the author of sin, sickness, sorrow, pain, and death. Satan wants us to believe bad things happen because God is not good, but is instead because Satan is evil. I kind of picture my life <laughs> as a diamond. It's rough, very rough. Um, and I know through scripture there is a loving God who sometimes allows Satan to test his children and even sometimes himself decrees turbulence in my life to make me what I can only be when the rough edges of that diamond are, are polished off. The diamond's fire and brilliance all comes down to the skill of the diamond cutter. There are five stages of polishing a diamond. The first is the planning stage, analyzing and evaluating how the diamond will be cut, assessing the best angle for each diamond to get the best color and brilliance. Number two is the cleaving and sawing stage. The cleaving sawing stage, cutting tools such as blades, saws, and lasers are used to cut the diamond into the desired shape to get the most brilliance. The third stage is the bruting stage. The bruting stage is the lathe, is the main tool used to rotate the diamond, and a diamond, L-O-U-P-E, loop, is used to determine how to show off the stone's best attributes before it is polished. Then the fourth stage is the polishing stage. The polishing stage includes both cutting the facets of the diamond and the final polishing. The diamond cutter creates each facet using a dop, to hold the diamond at the correct angle, grinding the diamond against a blade while spinning it, and a lubrication like oil or lanolin is applied. This process is repeated for each facet of the diamond. A polishing wheel and pads are used to polish each facet. This polishing phase is a very time-consuming process and removes any coarse marks left from faceting and for ultra-fine polishing to bring all the brilliance out on the diamond. I was thinking as I was going through this, um, I have a friend, Marsha, in Greenville that lost her son-in-law um, a month ago. He had a heart attack at 36 years old, leaving her daughter and their three little boys without their father. And Marsha, she's, she's a wonderful, wonderful lady, um, very godly. And I went to lunch with her a couple weeks ago, 
And as I was thinking about this polishing stage, I thought, when I went out to lunch with her, she just radiated God and how she just accepted it so well. I mean, full of pain. Don't get me wrong, but just saying we can trust God. I know we can trust God. And I was, as I was thinking about this, I thought I was just really drawn to her. I've always liked her, but now I was just drawn to her. There was something about her going through this hard trial that was just beautiful. I, th I thought it was beautiful what God was doing through her. Then the last stage is the inspection stage. After the long polishing stage of a diamond is completed, the diamond is carefully evaluated. If an external flaw is found, it can be sent back for further polishing. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> After the inspection is completed, each diamond gets a certification. And then each diamond is given a rating of excellent, very good, good, or fair. So I was just thinking, I, I hope that God can polish me and, and I can be evaluated as excellent and not bitter after the end of the polishing process. This process with the skilled hands of God, transforming the rough diamond of our life into a stone of value and beauty is actually, in actuality, it's the goodness of God. I am glad God did not make me a robot but gave me the gift of choice. Even though he knew in advance I would choose, or that Adam and Eve would choose to sin, and there I also choose to sin, and necessitating him to send his only son down to this sin-cursed world, leaving the comforts of heaven, to die a horrible death on the cross so that mankind could be saved from their sin. This sacrificial gift of God is also his goodness. God's goodness cannot be put into a box. It is not possible that a human understanding of goodness could be an exhaustive portrayal of God's divine goodness. What we do know is that Satan is our enemy and brings bad things into our life to ultimately destroy us. God is our friend and allows bad things in our life sometimes to make us better. I can't always see what is good and what is bad. I can't always determine that. Whether I understand is not really the question. Um, it's nice to understand. Sometimes I think I understand what God is doing, but sometimes things happen and I don't understand. But I can still trust in the goodness of God. Romans 8:28 says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God to them who are the called according to his purpose. I therefore concluded I must bless the Lord for all things, good and bad, because God is always only good. I want to tell you a story about our oldest son, and I forgot to get it out of my bag. Let me get that. His name is Jonathan. Let me see. Maybe I'll just use this. I want to read a story because it, it's easier for me emotionally <laughs> to read it and not think back about everything we went through. But my purpose in telling you this is threefold. Jonathan came down with mental illness when he was 18. And I'm going to explain to you what happened. I, mental illness is not much talked about. And that's one reason I want to talk about it, um, just because uh, I think it's important for us all to understand, because probably everybody in here knows somebody, or you may have it yourself. You, in, in a group this size, there would be somebody probably that has suffered some with some mental illness. Um, <coughs> excuse me. It's not understood very much. Um, and that's one reason I want to talk about it. And it's not counseled well sometimes. Sometimes we think um, all illness is a result of sin, which it is, because Satan <laughs> brought sin and sickness into the world. But sometimes we think someone who is in a clinical depression or has bipolar or something, it's their fault. Um, but it is a, 
um, I, I will explain a little bit more about what I'm trying to explain right now. The medical field tells us one in four people suffer with, with mental illness. Mental illness most often occurs in poets, artists, and musicians in that order. And you've probably heard of songwriters, haven't you, that have had clinical depression. Um, anyway, and so my husband is a poet and a musician, and I'm a musician, so it's, it's very strong. And my dad's family that I showed you up, nine of the children, eight of them, had mental illness. Um, I didn't explain all of them. The, um, Eunice, the oldest with the paranoid schizophrenia, was the worst, but they, a lot of them have suffered with mental illness. Figuring out illnesses that affect the mind is very difficult. Um, there is mental illness, there's bipolar anxiety disorder, there's dementia, which I am now dealing with, with my husband. There's Down syndrome, mental retardation, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. It's, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, that coughing right into that. I have a cough drop. But it's, it's hard when it affects your mind to understand sometimes what's going on. And, and you probably, a lot of times, don't understand. Um, it's hard to understand where the spiritual, the mental, and the physical overlap. And they all do overlap. One affects the other. And I understand the difficulty in separating behavior stemming from malfunctions of the mind from behavior stemming from people's spiritual choices. Because there, there is that as well. I, I'm very aware of that. Um, and traumatic events can trigger serious depression in people. But when the trauma eases, the depression almost always lets up when it's triggered by something that's severe, like a death in the family or something like that. However, mental illness needs no trigger. It doesn't have to. It's, it a lot of times does, but it doesn't need one. And when the trigger, if there is one, has passed, the illness does not. It's a lifelong it's a lifelong um, disease. Um, Jonathan grew up, let me see, let me get my two men. He was like any other active boy. <laughs> he was a lot of fun. Um, let's see, where do I start here? He was a challenge to discipline, but by second grade, I felt like all the disciplining had paid off. He, he just, he loved to have fun and he loved to annoy people too. <laughs> he was always making jokes. And um, I have a picture here. He became obedient and sweet. Um, this picture is him in the front on, the, on your left. And that's a uh, um, some of, it's some of the youth group, and that's our youth pastor who has since passed away from cancer as well. Um, but uh, that's Jonathan. He, um, I have two sons. <laughs> Jonathan is the oldest. Jason is on the left. He's the one I told you is a music pastor in Wisconsin now. And then my husband, Ron. In high school, Jonathan went through several rebellious years, but became a God-fearing kid his junior year of high school. He was very zealous in his witness for Christ and went out soul winning one to two times weekly to our Greenville downtown area. He was bright, popular, and president of his senior class at Bob Jones Academy. After his freshman year at Bob Jones University, Jonathan worked as a counselor at the Wilds Christian Camp and loved it. At the beginning of his sophomore year, he was asked to sing Rejoice in the Lord. It's a song my husband wrote when he lost his eye to cancer. He was asked to sing it as a solo on Vespers in front of 3,000 people. And he gave Ron's testimony before he sang it. He, he did a, a beautiful job. At this time, Jonathan was having some trouble with acne. I took him to our dermatologist who put Jonathan on an antibiotic for acne called Bactrim. After several weeks on the medicine, Jonathan began demonstrating some strange behavior. He stopped eating well and usually sat at the dinner table twirling his fork on his plate. He began saying he felt extremely nervous all the time. And he said, Mom, I'm just walking down the sidewalk at school, you know, and just to say hi, meet somebody on the sidewalk to say hi, my heart would be pounding like I was singing at Vespers again. When we walked by his bedroom at night, he sat staring at the book he was studying. 
when we walked by an hour later, he would still be staring at the same page he had been earlier. We couldn't imagine what was going on. I tried to think of anything that had changed recently in his life. All I could think of was the acne antibiotic and the allergy shots he had just started on. When I called both doctor's office, the nurses said, no, it's not what we're giving him. So I thought, okay. <laughs> After about four months of Jonathan's being on the acne antibiotic, I took another child to our dermatologist. While I was there, I mentioned to the doctor Jonathan's strange behavior. He said, it's the medicine, get him off of it. I said, I called and the nurse and she said, it's not. he said, it's the medicine, get him off of it. I said, are you sure? He said, it's three times, it's the medicine, get him off of it. And I said, well, how long will it take for him to kind of come back to himself? He said, probably about two weeks. Um, we took him off the medicine, but he didn't come back to himself. He kept getting worse and worse. Somehow he finished out the second semester of his sophomore year with good grades. Whatever he got, he learned while sitting in class because he couldn't study, he couldn't focus. We brought three different counselors to the house to try to help him. All the counselors told us that they felt Jonathan had a spiritual problem. And Jonathan thought he did. He thought it was something he had done to make him in this depression he was going into. We finally took Jonathan to our family doctor. Fortunately, Dr. Harris knew immediately that Jonathan was in a severe clinical depression. Dr. Harris's mother had had schizophrenia, so he was very familiar with mental illness. He put Jonathan on an antidepressant, which only made him worse. Jonathan had a rough summer after his freshman year, and when he started school the next fall, he had to drop out. Dr. Harris referred us to a Christian psychiatrist because Jonathan's depression was so severe, and psychiatrists are ones that deal with this all the time. And we've had several different Christian psychiatrists, and I love them to death. Very spiritual men. Jonathan went to lying in bed all day, staring at the ceiling, sometimes beating his head against the wall, sometimes ripping his clothes into shreds. He stopped talking almost completely. His brain chemicals were short-circuiting. I'd ask him things like, do you want ketchup on your hamburger? Uh, a couple minutes later, he wouldn't say anything. A couple minutes later, he'd say yes. And then I have to think back, what did I ask him? He just, um, his brain was locking up. He had what is called a flat affect. He exhibited no facial expression whatsoever. We took him to numerous doctors, psychiatrists who treat these illnesses all the time, as I said, and tried boatloads of medicine, some of which seemed to help, but only, but most only made him worse. None of which seemed to help and only made him worse, I'm sorry. One medicine we tried, I later found stuffed into his piggy bank. All along we thought the medicine wasn't working, but he wasn't even taking it. One of the problems with medicines for the brain is that they take a long time to work, so it usually is a while before you know if they're gonna work or not. We even took him to the only doctor that does shock treatment in Greenville. He told us Jonathan was a candidate for it, but he encouraged us to hold out a little longer and try a few more medicines before resorting to shock therapy. The first couple of years journeying through Jonathan's illness, I was utterly devastated and despondent. I would cry myself to sleep, and it took hours to finally get to sleep, hours of praying and quoting scripture. I wrestled with believing in my heart that God is good and that he really loved me and my family. So for about nine years, Jonathan suffered. We never left him alone. We tried, he tried to commit suicide four times and was hospitalized in a mental facility three different times for five weeks each. The doctor told us there was no hope. This was probably the way Jonathan was gonna be the rest of his life. You know with your children how you have dreams for their life and Jonathan was our oldest. At this point, I didn't care what Jonathan did as long as he served God. But this was horrible, it was like a death. Death of the son we once knew. We finally changed psychiatrist again to a Jeffrey Craddock. Dr. Craddock became a life savior for Jonathan. He persevered and found a combination of three medicines that eventually helped. Jonathan became much more like the Jonathan we had known. Dr. Craddock is a Christian who attributes the success to Jonathan's getting better to the prayers of God pe God's people. He told us later that at the time we first brought Jonathan in, he wondered if there was any hope for Jonathan. 
Jonathan went prematurely bald, as you can see, and put on like 60 pounds with his medicine. These medicines, a lot of them do that. However, he was able to start working at Chick-fil-A where he worked for a couple of years. His boss there told Ron and I that Jonathan was his best worker. And can you imagine <laughs> how that made us feel? I mean, Jonathan was a musician, had a gorgeous voice, wasn't singing any, wasn't playing the piano, his guitar, the trombone, anything. But I was so thankful at that point that he could work at Chick-fil-A. Um, he went to working part-time at Majesty Music in the shipping department, and the guys there loved him because Jonathan was very funny, like his dad. And he was very, very sweet. He was a huge help at home. He did everyone's laundry and made supper every night for me. He would have to go to bed directly following supper because the medicines made him so tired, but he always warned me not to clean up supper, saying he would do it in the morning. Our youngest son, Jason, that's up there, told me that Jonathan was his best friend. Our youngest granddaughter, I think I have a picture. Um, this is Ben's little girl. Of course, she's six now, but she loved Jonathan. She called him John John. That's our little Chloe. And there, Ron is, uh, Jonathan is working at the wilds. They would go, have, have you ever been to the wilds, anybody in North Carolina? That's a great camp, and this is there going down, uh, what's it called, White River Rafting, something, something like that. <laughs> anyway, that's Jonathan near the back. You can see him just loving to have a lot of fun. Um, to try to make a longer story short, on, in November 2012, Jonathan's name brand medicine contract was up, and consequently many generics came out. That meant our insurance company would not cover the cost of the medicine anymore, and it was $1,000 a month for one medicine, and he was on three. Um, so we went on search for a genetic. This became a four-month task. None of the generics were working for Jonathan. You know, it only has to be 85% of what the name brand is. And whatever that 15% was, it was whatever those generics were, they just weren't working for him. We finally found one generic. It was like in February. Um, and Jonathan said, Mom, this is the best I've ever felt. After a couple weeks on it, I said, praise the Lord, you know, because you're praying nightly. <coughs> and, um, I mean, he would get, he, he thought he could fly. He, he would get very delusional. He had schizophrenia. Um, we come to find out later. But um, anyway, uh, we, I, I was so thankful we found this medicine. And then Ron went to fill it the next month, and the, they stopped making it. So then we were back in search for another generic. And going on and off the generics, our doctor Craddock told us just it gave him akathisia. It's where you have that restless body syndrome. And he, he just finally took himself off. We didn't know. He, took him, he would not. He, we thought he was taking it, but he wasn't. A month later, Mother's Day, May 12, 2013, very much out of his mind, Jonathan tragically took his life. We only know that he was off his medicine because the coroner told us later there was no trace of it in Jonathan's blood. Because the Zyprexa will usually stay in your body for a month. We don't always know why things happen. This is his gravestone. You put on it and see you soon. <laughs> How can you help someone who has mental illness? Um, I want to just give you several ways that I've come up with. Committing to continual prayer for them because there are different levels of any mental illness, you know, like anything, like cancer, like any illness. There are different levels, different degrees of how serious it is. But it's usually a pretty hard thing to cope with. Um, so commit to continual prayer for them. Support the caregivers with love and kindness. 
Um, let the person who has mental illness know you love them by maybe a note or a gift because they may not show up for church many times. Jonathan drove to church so many Sundays and they just the anxiety of going in, he couldn't take and he drove home. So he knew people loved him um, and, and uh, they would send him notes or different things. Don't criticize the family to others or talk about them behind their back. Don't say, well, I think probably, oh, you know, they have that in their family or the mother's that way, you know, probably, you know. As a parent, you're going to go through that guilt, believe me. Like, what could I have done differently? Excuse me. So don't, don't blame them. You don't know, you don't know what they're going through. You don't know why they do what they do with their child. You know, maybe you'd say, oh, they should push them a little more. You know, if they, they're just too easy on them. Many times you try to push somebody in mental illness and you just make it worse. So you learn not to push them. If they don't feel like they can do something, don't say you have to go to church. You know, if they just can't do it. Uh, um, but sometimes, I mean, you, you do try to encourage them to do things they should. I'm not saying that, but you need to be very, very careful. Um, respect the person with mental illness as well as the entire family and don't judge them. Um, it's not, they don't have the plague. <laughs> but it's, it is hard because people with mental illness, if they end up coming to church, they don't want to be you know, like you right in their face like, oh, how are you? You know, they're already feeling like, does anybody know? You know, they, you feel guilty and you feel like I don't want anybody to know. So you have to be very careful. You just treat them like you treat anybody else, you know? And more than likely, they're gonna come out of it at a certain point. It depends what their case is or how much medicine they're on and all that. Um, treat the mentally ill person no different than you treat anybody else. Um, these are just a few little um, tips, maybe, because you may encounter that at some point if you haven't already. Um, Jonathan loved to sit and play the piano. He's written, um, I think, about 23 melodies that we have published, like 10 of them. Um, one of them is You Are Always Good that we're going to sing Sunday morning, and I'm going to have Megan come up and teach it to you in just a minute. But it's, it's one of his melodies. Um, it's higher ground, lift him up, the secret place, I am weak, but you are strong, shepherd of my soul. Um, the goodness of the Lord, friendly thorns. He's written, and he would love to sit at the piano. That was his solace. He was very talented. Um, <clears throat> but I'm very grateful to have that now, as you can imagine. Um, but what I want to say is that we sometimes have difficult things in our life. All of us do. But you have to practice almost to the point of near perfection to concentrate on your blessings and all the good things. Because you can make yourself miserable if you just focus on your challenges and the hard things. And I have more blessings than I can even count. I miss my Jonathan. And it was a hard 15 years going through that. Um, but I know he's in heaven. I know he was saved. I know he loved Jesus. I'm going to see him again. And, um, but I, I just think of, you know, like I've got Ben's two little children, Chloe and Clayton, adorable grandchildren. They're such love of my life. There's Jonathan with our daughter, Alyssa. He took her to a senior banquet once. Megan and Adam, oh my word. They are such a blessing. Like Ron got dementia, um, it's probably been about seven years now since I noticed symptoms of it. And he stopped working maybe four years ago and I was trying to run Majesty Music and it was like, you know, I, we, I always prayed that Jonathan would take over Majesty Music and then that didn't work out because of his illness. And then Megan started dating this lawyer, okay? Okay, all right, we must need a lawyer in our family, I don't know. And he started writing music, never written music. And it is phenomenal. 
I said, I've told him many times, Adam, it would be one thing if you wrote music and we'd say, uh, okay, maybe next year we'll try that one. I don't know, Adam. <laughs> Thank you for trying. <laughs> but it's phenomenal. God gave him to our family. He runs Majesty Music now. Megan writes beautiful music. We do these patch lives we're going to do tomorrow. That's Adam's idea. I mean, it's just such a blessing. Um, Ben and Tara, Ben is here. Ben's a preacher. Love that guy to death. He's solid as a rock. And then our, our Jason. I mean, I just have so many blessings. And this is our, let's see, oh, there's, there's our family. And this is our Megan and Adam's little baby, Ella. Mm. <laughs> Isn't she adorable? <laughs> Anyway, just so many blessings. This is our son, Jason, the one that's a music director in Wisconsin now, and he was in A Little Women. He was one of the stars, and that was a New York actress that came down to Bob Jones and did that, and they had him play Professor Bear against Joe. And he did a gorgeous job. So anyway, all I'm saying is we need to learn to focus on our blessings, and we need to trust God even when we don't understand what is going on. And I, uh, I was thinking about the Bible. There's so many stories in the Bible that men and women of God had to trust God despite unbelievable circumstances. Our Bible would be that big if, if all those stories were taken out. And now that Ron has got dementia, I've, I know that, and I've got to wind up real quick here, but God gave him a 40-year window to write music, to write poetry, to write music, and now that's what's taken from him. He's got what's called frontotemporal dementia, and he doesn't talk very much. He paces around the house. Um, his personality has changed, his behavior um, anyway, it's just what I'm dealing with now, but God is good. God, and that's the biggest point I want to get across today, is that God is always only good. Don't let yourself become bitter about something that's going on in your life. Let God make you better. Okay, let's close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we love you so much, and I thank you for this time and for these women being here and for this church being so gracious to us in hosting um, the Patch Live. And then for having this family conference, Lord, we love you so much. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.